Millions of people are angry. They're angry because they are working harder, but have less and less to show for it. They've been told that immigrants are the source of their problems, and that we should turn the clock back on civil rights. Others told them that the social justice movement is the source of their problems. They equate the movement to failed socialist movements of the past. Now, they're being told that violence may be the only path left for them. It's true that in previous generations, millions moved up in class in America through hard work and diligence. Almost anyone with initiative could go back to college, get a good paying job, and move up in class, and live the American middle class dream. But today, the American middle class is disappearing. And America ranks near the bottom of industrialized nations, in upward mobility. Trapping millions of Americans in permanent cycles of poverty. Where they sit, waiting for some, lucky break, or a lottery ticket to free them. As Bernie Sanders said, for many, the American dream has become a nightmare. Millions of other highly skilled Americans are underappreciated, and stuck in low-paying dead-end jobs. Others, are living from paycheck to paycheck in their efforts to maintain a middle-class lifestyle. Occupations that used to pay a living wage, now pay of pittance of what they used to pay. And none of this happened by accident. It was all by design. As Elizabeth Warren said, people feel like the system is rigged against them. And here is the painful part, they're right. The system is rigged. And indeed the system is rigged, and that rigging was architected by one man. Neutron, Jack Welch, former CEO of General Electric. As Welch would say, public hangings are teaching moments. Every company has to do it. In 1981 GE was a world-class corporation with a formidable engineering legacy. It was the home of a diverse set of class-leading labs in the areas of aerospace, medical imaging, consumer appliances, communications. Developed over a century of dedicated stewardship, these labs were a national engineering asset. And whereas GE's co-founder Thomas Edison's vision was to light American cities and democratize electricity. Welch's vision for his world-class engineering labs and their staffs when he took them over in 1981 was to gut them in an effort to reduce costs and boost GE's short-term stock price. Thousands of talented engineers and scientists were thrown on the street as Welch's rank and yank philosophy took hold at GE. Even profitable divisions were cut if their short-term return potential didn't meet Welch's standards for quick returns. Factories that had been national assets were closed, even if they were doing profitable work. World-class research and development efforts were mothballed, providing openings for foreign competitors to step in. Company CPAs were given the job of making it all look legitimate, boosting the stock price, even as GE's future potential was being hollowed out. But this short-sighted thinking showed enormous short-term benefits, as GE stock prices began to soar. Jack went on to spread the gospel of short-term profits by promoting his books and working the lecture circuits. He established training academies to spread his destructive ideas throughout the American business culture. And as Jack's ideas took hold, the dominoes began to fall. Massive layoffs became normalized. Pension plans disappeared. Factory jobs moved overseas. Factory towns became ghost towns. And homelessness exploded in our major cities. As the American dream of affordable home ownership began to slip from our grasp. As did America's world-class lead in research and development. And, if you want to know why we didn't get to Mars by the year 2000, ask Jack. He's the one who dismantled the labs that could have taken us there. As this graphic from the Economic Policy Institute shows, salaries began flatlining in the early 80s. Before Jack, a single high school graduate could support a family of four. After Jack, many two-income families with some college typically live paycheck to paycheck. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. 
the cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of Heaven's armies. If you want to know why you're working harder, and falling farther and farther behind, ask Jack. But the worst part of Welch's legacy is this. That we continue to accept that poverty is exclusively the fault of the poor. Rather than the byproduct of an immoral and corrupt management culture, sacrificing the best interests of our citizens and the future our country at the altar of short-term profits. Not to mention hollowing out our once world-class factories in the name of short-term profits. A wise woman builds her home, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. And yet we sit passively while self-righteous politicians stigmatize the unemployed, the struggling, and the homeless. In part, because many of us have not yet succumbed to the forces that drive people into poverty, and keep them there. Or, we might even blame ourselves, if we inevitably we get caught in the traps that beset so many others, we once looked down on. Fiercely clinging to a fairly tale, myths about the middle class, and a sense of economic security that no longer fits today's current realities. Let's revisit that, fairy tale, land for a moment, before coming back to current realities. In America, we like to believe we have created a truly model society. Based upon solid, American, middle-class values. A welcoming society, with the doors of opportunity open to all. Where young families can prosper. And parents can raise their children to their full potential so that they can be whatever they want to be, with each new generation surpassing the last one. Which is why when students at Wharton Business School were asked how much average Americans made, they responded somewhere between $100,000 and $200,000. The real number in 2021 is $55,000 for men, $45,000 for women. But the poverty trap is not a subject that's covered in our elite business schools, the truth is that our model society has become a facade, swallowed up by greed and corruption, and for many the American dream has become an American nightmare. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. With the face of poverty taking many forms, from the single mother and child forced to live in substandard housing, to those forced to live on the streets. And each one has a story. A uniquely American story. Many of us would be shocked if we knew how many people had been trapped here at one time. Dr. Phil came from a poor family, but managed to escape the traps of his sometimes homeless youth. We will talk about eight traps that help to keep people in poverty. Keep me from the traps they have set for me, from the snares of those who do wrong. I'm so tired of seeing panhandlers along this street. There are plenty of jobs out there. If these folks wanted to work, they wouldn't have ended up on the street. It's your fault, sorry. It doesn't matter if thieves broke into your apartment and robbed you blind. Or whether you were suddenly downsized from the company you faithfully served for 20 years. Or whether a hacker suddenly emptied out your life savings. Or whether a lawsuit forced the company into bankruptcy. Or whether one of the company accountants made off with the company retirement fund. Or whether an industrial accident shuttered your factory forever. Or whether a medical emergency sent you into a tailspin. In America, it's still on you. Jim Cramer was homeless after thieves broke into his apartment and stole everything he had. He managed to escape, and today, he has his own investment show on cable. Those who mock the poor insult their maker, those who rejoice at the misfortune of others will be punished. How did that new hire work out this week? I had to fire her on her second day. Why? What did she do? We take our image seriously. You can't come in with a stain on your jacket. What? 
She didn't buy a new wardrobe for this job? When you've got money and savings, you have many more options than someone who doesn't. For example, wardrobe shopping can be an option when you have disposable income. But low-paying service jobs provide limited options or opportunities for upward mobility. And credit card debt at predatory loan rates is often more of a trap than a ticket out. Limited access to health care may require dependence on social programs. Hillary Swank and her mother lived in their car until Hillary escaped through a breakthrough role in Boys Don't Cry. Those who oppress the poor insult their maker, but helping the poor honors him. People blame others for their poverty. If you don't like your menial job, start your own business. Yep, that's what Donald Trump did, and look at where he is now. Financial discrimination includes redlining, profiling, loan scamming, and low-balling of vulnerable groups. Redlining is the practice of drawing a red line around poor minority neighborhoods for the purpose of loan discrimination. Profiling bases credit in part on race or ethnic origin. Scams often target vulnerable populations, like minorities and seniors. Low-balling deliberately lowers property values in ethnic neighborhoods. Redlining is a remnant of segregation, and while illegal, is still practiced in some areas. It lowers property values, resulting in higher loan rates, and is especially tough on small businesses. In effect, it locks in generational poverty. Don't rob the poor just because you can, or exploit the needy in court. They hired another college guy today. Yeah. That ship sailed for me. Why not go back to school? You are young enough. Right. The high school that I went to barely prepared me for my mailroom job here. If you grew up with access to good schools, with well-equipped classrooms and well-paid caring teachers, your chances of going to and graduating from a good college are increased. And getting that high-paying dream job in corporate America. But if those kind of resources were a rarity in your neighborhood, your dreams are well, just that. Dreams. But wait, I made it. Aren't these just excuses? Good for you. But the average black family has only 14.6% of the inherited wealth of the average white family. And that difference can buy a lot more opportunity. Not to mention ballooning college costs, exceeding 20 times what they were in past decades. Leaving college graduates from all backgrounds with debt burdens far in excess of previous generations. Michael Orr was homeless until a white family rescued him from the streets, paid for his schooling, and he became a millionaire player for the Baltimore Ravens. Rescue the poor and helpless. Deliver them from the grasp of evil people. Sorry we had to lay you guys off. Larry embezzled $100,000 from the salary pool. Did he get arrested for embezzlement? Nah, we fired him, but they wanted to keep it out of the papers. So no. What about Tommy? Did he get laid off too? Oh yeah, Tommy got arrested. He stole $100 from the coffee club. White collar criminals break the law every day. But the most that is done is a minor scolding, and many do not even receive that. But let a poor black guy get caught with a broken tail light, and the police are all over him. And you can kiss that job goodbye. And God help you if you end up before a judge for even a menial offense. Lawyers are very expensive, and nowhere are the laws more slanted than in criminal penalties for crack possession, which are ten times that of cocaine, common in white communities. 
and a poor man with a record is largely unemployable. There are exceptions, but it is a very difficult trap to overcome. When George Floyd was arrested for allegedly passing a fraudulent $20 bill, he paid for it with his life. But Wells Fargo's repeat episodes of defrauding the poor has not resulted in a single arrest or indictment. Tamar Rice was murdered by a neighborhood vigilante who perceived him to be a threat to the neighborhood, but when hundreds of thousands in that community and others were dying of oxycodone overdoses, no criminal charges were brought against corporate officers, even though they lied about how addictive it was. When Philando Castile attempted to show his legal handgun license to an officer at a traffic stop, he was shot and killed in front of his daughter, by the officer on duty. But, the gun manufacturers that sold the Uvalde shooter the assault weapons that enabled him to slaughter 19 elementary school children face no charges. The aggressive marketing of military-style weapons is not against the law in this country. For I know the vast number of your sins and the depth of your rebellions. You oppress good people by taking bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. But for a poor man with limited education, there are few traps more powerful than the next one. Alcohol is everywhere in our culture. And it comes in a number of pleasing forms and mixes. We toast with it. Celebrate our victories with it. Addiction to it knows no class. Or racial boundaries. People of all classes and backgrounds fall under its spell. It has broken the will of the strongest of men. And even when seen as a trap, it can be inescapable anyway. But, as bad as alcohol addiction often is, drug addiction is often far worse. Addicts often start out young, using, gateway, drugs like marijuana, or now, CBD. But then go on to, graduate, to harder, more addictive and damaging drugs like cocaine or crack. Or heroin. Fentanyl, heroin, cocaine, and meth together account for close to 50,000 overdose deaths a year. Highly addictive opioid prescription painkillers have accounted for more than 50,000 additional deaths per year. Some of these new drugs are so addictive that they raise philosophical questions regarding the human will, and whether their will is preserved under their influence. Robert Downey Jr. escaped drug addiction early in his life to go on to be a Hollywood superstar hero as Iron Man. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. John's uncle got him a cushy job at his firm. Life's great when you have the connections. Connections are essential for building businesses. But poor business people lack access to such connections. And didn't go to colleges where powerful connections were available. In fact, you are much more likely to make acquaintance with these gentlemen. And this young man. Than with this young businesswoman. Or, this one. Which makes it much more likely you'll end up here. Than here. Steve Jobs was adopted in his youth, only to end up homeless later after dropping out of college. He got a big break later, and ended up a billionaire CEO. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Donald Trump reportedly said, Black guys counting my money, I hate it. Even today, powerful business people remain wed to their traditional biases of what a productive work environment looks like. As opposed to more diverse work environments that have become more common in the new global marketplace. Improved educational and work opportunities have brought prosperity to traditionally oppressed groups, and they have risen to the challenge. Shatterproof glass ceilings are still more the rule than the exception. With the NFL being one of the chief examples of racist hiring and promotion. And those racist attitudes have a way of trickling down to the HR office, where hiring and recruitment decisions are made.
Which is why the cycle of poverty continues to seem intractable, with millions remaining trapped in poverty. But the progress of recent decades is very real. But future progress depends upon dialogue, and dumping tightly held stereotypes. Many great talents like J.Lo were homeless before they got their big breaks. Help him to defend the poor, to rescue the children of the needy, and to crush their oppressors. The cycle of poverty is a vicious cycle, and it often gives you only one shot to get out of it. Wealthy men of the past, like Thomas Edison, recognized this, and endeavored to give back to the communities that gave them so much. Carnegie gave of his fortune to build libraries to promote education and literacy. In his day, Henry Ford worked to make his cars affordable for all of his employees. Today, Elon Musk is working to make electric cars affordable for everyone. But too many of today's business leaders have drunk from the poison well of Jack Welch, allowing our industrial infrastructure to crumble for the sake of short-term profits. They have learned nothing from the lessons of GE, which entered a slow death spiral after Jack Welch jumped ship two decades ago. Its lack of infrastructure meant that GE had nothing to fall back on after the 9-11 attacks and the 2008 financial crisis. Its stock fell to $6 per share before it was rescued by Warren Buffett. This despite GE being led by a series of brilliant CEOs that took Herculean measures to recover from the damage. And the threat of poverty is a greater threat today than in the past, with the possibility that AI and robotics might eliminate millions more traditional occupations, adding millions more to the poverty rolls. But that will only happen if we continue on the false assumptions that we couldn't be the next victims and accept an immoral business culture that lavishes the lion's share of the nation's fruits to those at the top of the food chain. There is plenty to be had by all, if we have the will to recognize that the fruits of the earth belong to all of God's children, and not a lucky few.